Hi guys, welcome back to another lecture um, on proteins, um, bioorganic chemistry on protein structure and biological related function. Uh, I'm actually very tired because I just recorded a lecture without turning on the volume, the voice. So basically, I was just talking to myself and nothing was recorded. So I'm, I need to redo it again. So here it is. I'm going to go quite fast. Alright, so um, we are currently on week 8. Okay, we are currently on week 8. However, um, because last week we didn't have any lecture, so I'm going to do, um, for today, I'm going to quickly go through structure and biological functions. And then on Thursday, I'm going to talk about um, your assignment. Okay, so this assignment will be carried out towards your uh, final mark and then starting from next week um, we're gonna try and follow through and and hopefully we'll be able to um, since tutorial has been incorporated in part of the lecture so hopefully we can push everything down a little bit um, so this will be on week 9 week 10 11 and week 12 over here okay so we'll see how it goes Alright, so last last two weeks we've looked at the importance of amino acid. Uh, hopefully you still remember the importance in um, the food industry, animals, uh, pharmaceutical and, and um, cosmetics. And we've also looked at um, the chemistries on how to synthesize amino acids. Okay, and also we've looked at on um, uh, the the ways by which when you synthesize using um, the chemical procedures, you produce a resume of L and D amino acids where you can use this resolution technique um, to separate the um, L and D amino acid um, using a, a chemical um, biochemical reaction. Okay, so this week we looked at uh, different types of protein structure. Um, so multiple polymeric form of amino acid forms a protein and. Uh, in another way, you can say that amino acids are the building blocks of um, protein. Okay, before this, we've looked at this um, backbone structure of a uh, protein with amino acid. And in the middle here, we do have its connecting via an amide bond. Okay, so what else? Uh, this week, we're going to learn a little bit on the number cultures, uh, polymeric amino acid, and um, different levels and structures of amino acids. Okay, generally, this is what we're going to cover today. We have primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. And you can see a slight definition on uh, what this structure means. I'm going to touch, um, I'm not going to touch this in very detail because we're going to cover it in the next few slides. Okay, first one. Uh, first one is the primary structure. It's a linear sequence of amino acid in a polypeptide chain um, linked via a covalent bond, um, in this case, an amide bond or a peptide bond, whichever you, you like. Again, uh, if you can't recall about this, go back to lecture one recording and uh, please listen to it. Um, the shape or the folding um, or, or the folding of a protein depends on, obviously it depends on the primary structure since it's the core and the side chain and the amino acid arrangement sequence will determine on how the protein actually folds. Um, over here, I've prepared um, uh, insulin. Okay, I hope everybody knows uh, the insulin. It's a protein that converts glucose to glucagon, our storage energy in, in the body. Okay, so insulin is made up of two chains, chain A and chain, chain B. And this is the sequence of um, the protein. Gotta pause, be right back. Hello? Hello? Okay, someone called but didn't answer. Okay, but anyhow, anyhow um, so, so this is the sequence of amino acid. So this is a primary sequence. So it's basically just a linear sequence of the amino acid. Some terminologies here is we have a C terminal. Okay, C means 
a carboxyl or carbon terminal okay because we have a carboxyl terminal over here and over on the other end we have what we call as n terminal okay because we have an amine group uh, nitrogen there so we call it n terminal so one is c terminal one is n terminal and all peptides will have um, an n and a c terminal unless otherwise you actually convert the n terminal to something else but you still call it as n terminal um, on the amine side okay how do i go to the next lecture Okay, moving on to the second one, it's the secondary structure. So, secondary structure refers to the first special arrangement or conformation of an amino acid in localized region of a polypeptide. Okay, to be specific, a sequence of amino acid will form an X-type structure in a three-dimensional space. So, um... And secondary structure can also describe how the segment of a protein backbone folds. Okay, so again, we will look at we will look at um the insulin chain A. So previously, we'll just look at uh, on primary structure. We'll just saw this. Okay, um, so that one is a uh, primary structure. On the secondary structure, you can actually see how um the uh, sequence fold. Okay, so the red is a carboxyl and the green is an amine okay if you just look at the primary structure you, you imagine that it's a linear right uh, like a straight chain polymer for example but in reality um, the structure actually folds in a certain way so if you follow the backbone like this you can actually see um, it's this one over here that goes up here like this until the end terminal so you can actually see the backbone actually folds in a certain way okay and this way is, is not really random because you, you do have a lot of interaction you do have a lot of um, attraction and repulsion um, a few factors that plays a role on how or why the structure folds uh, one way okay um, and the insulin structure can be uh, downloaded from a protein data bank and that's that's the code 3i40 okay secondary structure um, basically we will look at three main structures that is available in many proteins so the first one is what we call as alpha helix it's a type of uh, belong to a family of helix so helix means a spherical Okay, something like that. So that one is, is helix. Um, but alpha helix has its own properties and criteria compared to a beta helix or alpha 2 helix and so on and so forth. So when, when I... Uh, but in, for this lecture, we're just going to talk about um, the alpha helix specifically and not the other helix that is present in the biological system. And the second main structure that we have is um, the beta plated sheet. Okay, the beta plated sheet looks like this in the middle here okay it's basically when you have two polypeptides arrange uh, one another that forms kind of like a paper like structure so it's it's flat so that's why you call it a beta petit sheet it's not 100 percent flat it's kind of like if you fold a paper and then you kind of like uh, open it back up again it's it's not really flat flat but it's flat enough Okay, and the third structure that um, uh, I'm just going to mention about it here, but we, we're not going to show you anything. Um, it's what we call as um, a random coil. So I've put a, a inverted comma there because um, initially, originally, scientists call it as random because they do not know what makes the sequence um, turn or coil. But... Um, Nothing, nothing is um, random anymore. So th there is a, a forces acting on it. There, there is a reason why such and such happens. Um, so in this case, that's why I'm just going to call
call it coil or random coil so those two variation are interchangeable okay um so the structure over down here shows that um, um insulin so when you have a uh, two monoric insulin um joint together this secondary structure actually forms so if you just look at the um, um pdb pdb value of insulin which is i340 or 3f40 okay if you look at this if you download it and, and look at the structure there is no beta sheet um structure in insulin however this researcher this group of researcher found out that um in the presence of uh, a concentrated um insulin a, a tertiary structure or a secondary structure of beta sheet actually formed so it's it's very interesting because uh, up until today we do not really know like for sure how insulin works whether it works individually whether it works in tandem and so on and so forth so um this discovery is kind of like an eye opener to people um that says you know our protein is more complex than what we initially imagine and things such as this um, can happen okay uh, secondary structure folding from the figure polypeptide chain are flexible yet they are conformationally restricted so it's flexible but it's a bit restricted so it, it can move around a little bit um, but not too much so there are three factors that influences the folding the first one is an almost um, planar region about each um, m-mat bond a second one is the presence of a lot of hydrogen bonds and the third one is um, due to steric hindrance let's, let's look at those factors one by one so the first factor the regional planetary about each amino, uh, peptide bond or mi bond so a partial double bond character prevents free rotation about the peptide bond thus creating uh, a planar region so that the carbon and nitrogen and the two atoms to each is attached are held rigidly in a plane okay so remember this resonance structure and you have a carbonyl and next adjacent to the carbonyl we have um, a, a lone pair so what it means is that um, this lone pair can form a pi bond with the carbon and the carbon has a pi bond with and the oxygen so basically you have this um, a flat structure so you now when you have a double bond it's kind of like rigid it doesn't really move so when you have a resonance structure like this so it restricts the movement of the amide bond um, and thus creating kind of like a, a plane okay um, if you want to see it more clearly uh, move back to insulin we, we looked at chain A and what you can see here is that if, if you focused on the um, the carboxyl here and the carboxyl there it's almost like a, a, a flat sheet okay, even though it's kind of slightly bent um, but yeah <coughs> Not, nothing in biology uh, is set in stones so there are theories behind it but uh, it, it, from here you can actually see it's not really really um, planar sorry we, you don't look at the the carbonyl you actually look at um, the carbonyl and the um, amine group because this is what supposed to build the planar region so it's almost planar like right um, but yeah it, it, there, there's still a little bit of uh, leeway to uh, move probably about less than 10 degrees uh, and second note in contrast with peptide bonds the bonds connecting the alpha carbon are pure single bonds um, the two adjacent rigid peptides may rotate about these bonds taking on various orientation this freedom of rotation about two bonds of each amino acid allows proteins to fall in many different ways so even though um, the um, carbonyl or the amide bond is rigid but uh, if you looked at the alpha carbon um, 
so here the alpha carbon between all these um, bonds so alpha carbon there so we have another alpha carbon here okay so all these bonds between the alpha carbon and the amide can freely rotate okay if you can't imagine this um i'll probably show you another software that you can use to download and and see this or uh, additionally if you do have um a module kit a chemical module kit you can actually put it in and and you know you can play around with the kit okay factor number two hydrogen bonding the strongest bond in a biological system um currently at least as of 2020 okay it is still the strongest um non-covalent that's the word non-covalent bond in a biological system because you do have um uh, a covalent bond you, you do have a disulfide bond which is a covalent bond which is stronger than a hydrogen bond but in terms of non-covalent bonding hydrogen bond is the strongest in a biological system okay hydrogen bond uh maximizing the number of peptide groups that engage in hydrogen bonding um, hydrogen bond between one carbonyl oxygen of one amino acid and the amide hydrogen of another um, can be formed thus minimizing the overall energy of the uh, protein uh, minimizing energy minim uh, minimizing entropy and whatnot maximizing entropy okay um, a bond, the bond strength for hydrogen is roughly between 2 to 40 kilo um, joule per mole and it's formed between protons and electronegative atoms um, this is just a refresher um, sun nos ons it's up to you. you you can have a different variation but in terms of amino acids so only these amino acids um, side chain okay only these amino acid side chains can form a hydrogen bond um, so including you know polar and charged residues and all amide bonds can form a hydrogen bond um, as an example on the right hand side um, this is the hydrogen bond forming between um, the side chain of asparagine and serine so that one is the serine that one is asparagine okay you can see the hydrogen bond uh, forming in the middle between those two residues all right factor number two hydrogen bonding um it, it hydrogen bonding resulted in the formation of alpha helix uh, as i mentioned it's a subset of a helix structure so l amino acid produces a clockwise coil structure or you call it as right hand turn we'll, i'll describe about it later and there are 3.6 amino acids per turn viewed from the top to produce one circle so if you uh, for, for this one if you look at from this top over here to produce one circle like that it requires 3.6 amino acid okay that's what it means by this okay now the clockwise coil structure if you follow from your arm over here moving through your palm and then your finger you can actually see that it's it's moving in one direction right so the direction is kind of like like that okay it's uh, anti-clockwise so you you can actually um follow through the anti-clockwise anti-clockwise is is actually yeah it is anti-clockwise okay the the formation um follows through how if you use your thumb to point upwards okay that's how the peptide um or, or the, the sequence rotates okay so again remember if you follow this it will rotate in in similar way as if you are rotating your uh, finger okay and vice versa for the amino acid you will have a left-handed helix if you have the same sequence to the l so for example if the l is a g g g g g g g um, l amino acid you will form 
right-handed helix if you have a D of all this amino acid in the same sequence it will form on the left-handed helix formation interesting isn't it all right so um, this is just to show you um, the structure so 3.6 amino acid per turn okay forming one circle if you look at from up here um, and then uh, from this side to this side if you follow through this this is what we call as one one turn okay and this uh, figure over here is just a representation of um, a kind of a linear representation I would say of of the turn okay where you can see um, after each three about three and a half amino acid you will have um, a hydrogen bond forming from the uh, between the N terminal and the C terminal okay so that's one amino acid two amino acid three amino acid and this one is a fourth amino acid so but it's in between so it's three and a half or 2.6 amino acids each amide group will interact with the amide group three residues above and below it to form a hydrogen bond. Okay, we will see um, it more clearly on the next slide. Okay, alpha helix. Um, each peptide bond is trans and planar. Okay, um, planar because of the amide bond. The NH group of each M each peptide um, roughly downwards points roughly downwards. Um, parallel to the axis of the helix and the carbonyl points roughly upwards also parallel to the helix so you know upwards and downwards are, are just two um, two words that we use we, we can use interchangeably it doesn't matter whether it's pointing upwards or downwards what important oh, is that all of them are pointing in the same direction say for example if you looked at a carbonyl group here okay all of them are pointing downwards right and if you look at the um, the amine group all of them are pointing in the same direction okay so this is a criteria for an alpha helix the company group of each uh, peptide bond is hydrogen bonded to the NH group of the peptide bond of four amino acids um, away okay so if you look at here it says here three residues over here it says four um, so we take in the middle 3.6 amino acid or 3.5 whichever you want and um, another criteria for an alpha helix is that the R groups points outwards from the helix so we have the middle bit of helix here all the other residues are the R, R chain are pointing outwards okay um, all right so this is to reduce uh, steric interaction so and we we'll move on to factor number three which is um, steric interaction or steric hindrance in the form of the first structure of Felix we will look at the uh, um, a beta sheet next so the need of adequate separation between neighboring R groups to minimize steric strain and repulsion of light charges. For example, illustrated on the right hand side is leucine number three and leucine number six. Um, in bold, you can see that the um, the side chain are actually pointing opposite to one another. Okay, so this is what it means by trying to minimize the uh, steric strain and um, repulsion of um, light charges light charges meaning similar okay in this case nonpolar and nonpolar or it can be uh, the same charge plus and plus or minus and minus and so on and so forth okay so um, if say for example you have the R group on the same side as illustrated in figure here you can see there's a lot of crowding okay so structure like this are not formed because of a steric hindrance 
moving on to um, the second structure which is uh, we, we are still going to talk about factor number three which is steric hindrance but we are going to look at the uh, beta plate sheet um, so for a beta plate sheet there are two substructures one is called as parallel and the other one is called as anti-parallel it's, it's basically uh, based on the terminal and how the uh, polypeptide are chain are, are, are arranged so if it range in a similar manner then you call it parallel if it's um, range in opposite manner you call it anti-parallel so imagine that one is c terminal one is n terminal then you will have something like that okay very simple concept parallel and anti-parallel so where is the hydrogen bond coming here so the common group of each peptide bond is hydrogen bonded with the n um, group of the peptide bond of a neighboring chain so over here you will see one chain and you will see the second chain over here, this side so they can be connected through a backbone somewhere there or it can simply be two different peptide interacting with one another okay and um, you can see the carbonyl group forms a hydrogen bond with the amide group okay and it's and it's not just one place it's at multiple place so that's why it forms kind of like a linear pleated sheet okay so you fold the sheet uh, you fold the sheets and then um, you open it up then you can see the sheet is kind of like forming a zigzag pattern like that if you look it from from this side okay so this is what it means by a beta plated sheet okay so as a summary for secondary structure you have um, a helix structure a pleated seed structure and a random coil so um, just read through the information given and for random coil it's a random arrangement of peptide backbone um, the randomness is a definition only it doesn't mean that it's always random there's, there's always an interaction that causes um, the backbone to move or to fold in a certain way and finally some uh, coil serve as a joint for protein big protein movement when there's energy okay if you are interested then come and talk to me I'll gladly talk about it but for this lecture we are not going to talk about it at all again this is another figure representation so that is what it means by a beta petit sheet and uh, what you see here is one pointing up pointing down and pointing up so this one is the anti-parallel beta sheet okay all right so moving on to the next structure which is the tertiary structure the tertiary structure of a protein is the three-dimensional arrangement of all atoms in the protein protein folds spontaneously in solution to maximize their stability and the stabilizing interaction in the protein can occur uh, between a peptide group between the side chains and between peptide and the side chain itself okay so the interaction is not limited to only the R groups or only the backbone so it, it can occur anyway um, so to look at this we need to go back to the previous lecture uh, slide and you can see um, this one is a hydrophobic interaction between um, R groups um, this one electrostatic interaction between the R group stars of a bridge between the R groups hydrogen bonding between um, well in this case it's from a similar um, polypeptide okay from a similar polypeptide forming a beta petit sheet um, this one hydrogen bonding forming an alpha helix okay and um, yeah and so on and so forth <clears throat> So, what are the most important factors um, affecting tertiary structure? So, there's five is listed here: hydrogen bonding, electrostatic interaction, uh, van der Waals, of which three of these are non-covalent, while this one is a covalent uh, bond structure. And you can see the energy 
is way different um, and therefore each has its own advantage and disadvantage and um, yes So hydrogen bond, uh, it's the same slide, more or less the same as previously shown. So I'm just gonna skip that one. The second is uh, electrostatic uh, structure where you have a covalent bond of energy approximately twenty kilojoule per mole. It form when they are opposite charge or polarity. So if you have a plus and a minus, then it will form an uh, electrostatic interaction. And for peptides and proteins, the R groups that normally involve in this are arginine, lysine, which are um, cationic, and glutamic and aspartic acid, which are glutamic acid and aspartic acid, which are um, anionic. Okay, and um, shown here are uh, the hydrogen bond between a lysine and aspartic acid. Okay. When the walls um, interaction is a non covalent bond with a bone strength of roughly 2 kJ per mole formed between two or more non polar R groups. So, um, illustrated here is leucine leucine hydrophobic interaction or when the walls interaction between um, one leucine over here and then another leucine over here. And the first covalent bond is um delphite bond that is formed between two tile groups from cysteine residues. Um so two cysteine close proximity cysteine readily oxidize and form a SS bond or SS bridge. Um so it greatly stabilizes protein tertiary structure as you can see because the bond strength is very very high so the structure will become very very rigid um, but the R group or the cysteine amino acid are very restrictive um, there's less abundance in protein structure um, for some reason um, and part of the reason is because the um, the, 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 it will depend on the function of the protein itself. If the protein requires um, high stability against, say, change in temperature or change in pH, then normally you will see that protein has more desulfide bridge. Okay, so nature kind of like uses desulfide bridge um, as a mean to um, make protein more rigid so it functions in a wide a wider range of temperature and wider range of uh, pH change okay in this case we have insulin you have insulin throughout your body you have insulin in your stomach you have insulin in your lungs you have insulin in in your um, intestine you have insulin everywhere so insulin needs to be quite rigid and flexible um, that it can function in white space, white area, okay? Um, so as illustrated here in red, this is a disulfide bond um, within um, the chain A, okay? Um, and the blue over here is actually a disulfide bond with um, chain B. Okay, a little bit of chemistry, mild oxidation joins two molecules of a thiol or cysteine into a disulfide, forming a disulfide linkage or disulfide bridge or disulfide bond between the two thiol molecules. This reaction is reversible. Okay, and mild reductive cleavage cleavages um, the disulfide. Okay, so um, it's, a, it's kind of like in equilibrium in a certain condition. Okay, so you have two cysteines, you oxidize them, you form a desulfide bridge, um, you reduce the desulfide bridge, you form two cysteine residues. Okay, uh, even more for SS bond, two cysteine and protein can oxidize to form desulfide bond. The bond is the only covalent bond that are found 
between non-adjacent amino acid in the peptide and the protein that contributes to the rigidity and overall shape and functions of a protein for example insulin chain a and chain b is connected via two desulfide bond um, listed in blue uh, colored in blue and black okay you can see um, so the green is chain a uh, cyan is chain b and you can see if you follow with the backbone you can you can see this that's of a bond forming between um, the two chain um, colored in blue and another one attached to the red um, colored in black okay and we have one internal that's of a bond over here so that's it for tertiary structure. Moving on to the quaternary structure. Some proteins have two or more polypeptide chains or subunit to function. A protein with a single polypeptide chain or subunit is called a monomer. A protein that has two subunits um, called a dimer, a three subunit, a tetramer, and so on and so forth. So it follows the chemistry naming. So if you only have like one polypeptide, you call it a monomeric protein. If you need to have two of the identical or it doesn't have to be identical but two of uh, a polypeptide you call it a dimeric protein if you have a three monomeric you call it a trimer if you have four you have a quaternary a uh, quaternary quaternary uh, Quatmer. Okay, um, so it, it's it, it follows the chemistry naming. I'm tired, I, I can't think straight now. The quaternary structure of protein describes the way the subunit are arranged with respect to each other, and the subunit of a protein are held together by chemical interaction. So it can be a hydrophobic interaction, hydrogen bonding, electrostatic, it can be a disulfide bridge um, that holds between one subunit to another. Okay, so, and these proteins needs to be connected before it can function properly. For example, no, well, I've been keeping on mentioning again and again is insulin. So insulin has two chain, two polypeptide chains, and they are connected via desulfide bridge. Without this bridge, insulin doesn't function. Okay, similarly, um, so in this case, this uh, monomeric. Um, or, or this subunit for insulin the subunits are non-identical subunit but for hemoglobin you actually have two of identical subunit okay so you have two of alpha chain and two of a beta chain that conjoins together in a three dimension space and form hemoglobin that transports um, oxygen um, throughout our body Okay, so uh, I guess, oh, I, think I, s I guess that's it for um, uh, different levels of protein structure. We'll, let's move on to protein biological function. We'll just, you know, touch a little bit on about it. So each protein has its own biological function, and protein with similar function may have different sequence and structure. For example, hemoglobin in the red blood cells functions to carry oxygen okay hemoglobin functions in red blood cells to carry oxygen um, it's a tetramer subunit however in our muscles we have myoglobin also functions as oxygen carrier but it's a monomeric protein so you have two proteins with similar function but has different structures okay having said that Protein structure is unique to its own function and condition and environment okay, because you know environment in our bloodstream and muscle are two different things and the muscle is more acidic okay, because when you move you produce a lot of lactic acid so you reduce the pH um, yeah so two functions uh, uh, two similar function one similar function two different proteins two different function um, structures Okay, but this modification can also result in um, lack of function or uh, 
resulted in a disease. For example, um, a disease called sickle cell uh, anemia. So a normal red blood cells looks like this. Okay, it's uh, if you draw it in sideways, is kind of like a concave and convex type, like a, a bulge um, um, donut. Okay, uh, people that um, develop sickle cell uh, anemia, the red blood cells looks like a sickle, like a crescent. Okay, like like the the crescent moon. Okay. Um, and this is as a result of a very very simple thing so abnormal hemoglobin that forms um, strands instead of you know floating around individually so you can see here um, each dot in here represents one hemoglobin and um, because of the mutation that causes uh, hemoglobin to form in a different three-dimensional structure uh, the abnormal hemoglobin forms strands that causes the red blood cells to form like a sickle like okay and this is just as a result of one amino acid substitution okay it's not even 10 it's not even two it's it's one so one amino acid uh, changes can result in a disease again it doesn't mean that any change is bad because um, if for example you are a bacteria um, that wants to develop uh, a resistance against uh, a particular anti uh, antibi antibiotic okay what you normally do is you change one amino acid so you change one amino acid you change the structure of your protein but your protein still has its function but then you develop a resistance um, against a uh, an antibiotic that attacks um, in a certain particular configuration. So, um, you know, it's, it's very flexible. So, I mean, so again, as I mentioned, um, you know, some changes might be good, um, some changes are bad. Now, there are the examples, okay, for example, diabetes mellitus, uh, cystic fibrosis, um, Alexander disease, Alzheimer disease, prion disease, um, so there are, oh god. Hopefully this is um, saving, okay. Uh, so what you will do is um, uh, next Thursday I'm gonna uh, give another picture on how you can use this information to produce an assignment and a video based on these other diseases. All right, so towards the final subchapter, which is protein denaturation. Just gonna check if we have slides. Yes, we do. Okay, protein denaturation. So we have looked at four different levels of protein structure from primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. And when the protein reaches its quaternary structure, um, it has a certain function. Okay, and we know that um, the change in one amino acid in the primary structure can actually severely affect uh, on the quaternary structure. So the natural process of folding results in a specific shape of a protein with a specific function. So what happens if we denaturalize this protein? So denature, okay? Um, so this is the natural process, it's nature. Denaturalize or denature is kind of like the opposite. So what is protein denaturation? It's a destruction of the unique three-dimensional folding of a protein. So it leads to temporary or permanently loss of function or activity. So um, some proteins are more flexible. Some proteins, they will just lose uh, the function or activity 100%. Okay. It's like unfolding um, a protein into its linear form. So it's, it's like, you know, you have this folded protein and then you take one end 
and then you take the other end and then you pull it apart so that it becomes a linear okay so that is what the natural um, denaturalization um, happen okay so a very common example is boiling an egg so you have an egg if you just break the egg the egg um, the uh, albumin is colorless right it's, it's transparent but once you boil it you you put in a heat in there uh, what you what you do, are doing is actually you denature um, the albumin thus it changes so the physical property changes from transparent and a bit jelly like to become more of a, a solid and uh, white okay that's denaturation so when and how you denaturation can occur so first one pH change so if you put um, an acidic um, protein in a basic environment the pH change will cause a change in the charge of the side chain of the protein thus this stops um, the electrostatic interaction and hydrogen bond and so on and so forth so you kind of like you know you break apart the uh, three-dimensional um, the sorry you break apart the um, interaction thus the structure breaks apart as well um, you can do it via chemical additive you can put uh, urea you can put guanidine because uh, for example urea and guanidine for example can form a stronger hydrogen bond um, and, and therefore it, it forms a stronger bond with protein residues or amino acid residues um, thus the protein will not be able to maintain its original structure um, you can also denature proteins via addition of organic solvent okay so you um, association with nonpolar groups of protein interferes with hydrophobic interaction so therefore affecting uh, protein hydration you can also do like cooking an egg you put in heat or put a lot of agi uh, agitation so you increase the molecular motion which can disturb uh, disrupt the forces holding the protein structure in place okay summary is it's basically straightforward um as, as what uh, we discussed earlier I'm a bit tired to repeat everything so just go and, and read through okay and some references and um, next week I'm gonna uh, show you some videos on on, on that, that you can install to your laptop so that you can actually play around and see um, proteins in the three dimension structure where you can actually move it around and stuff so these structures all of these that that you see are actually um, drawn by me in the software okay um, so yeah we um, just a brief overview of the structure of the program okay um, so this so you can actually see um, the protein you can move it around so this is insulin okay you can actually see the sequence of amino acid up there and you can actually select um, uh, and, and do coloring and whatnot okay so that's, that's what I did and that's that's how we do it okay um, if uh, you want to see the the turn 3.6 amino acid per turn is basically this okay if you look at from the top to move from here to, to form one turn down here is roughly about three amino acid three three point six amino acid okay and this is what i mean by uh, you don't see um, a beta sheet over here okay but you do see it if you do have a dimer of um, um, of an insulin mm, i think that's it um, if you have any issues please you know um, drop off uh, whatsapp me or something uh, but otherwise that's that's it um, thank you and see you guys this Thursday bye